Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Healthcare. We have a great program for you. We begin with a state-of-the-art cancer-fighting treatment. It's called CyberKnife. And to tell us all about it, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Cameron with the Healthy Medical Director of Radiation Oncology. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Cameron. Thank you, Jody. So exactly what is CyberKnife? And, and how does it differ from other treatments that are available to patients? Okay, so first of all, broadly speaking, is that radiation can be delivered in six and a half weeks, or we can, we can give it in high dose, high precision radiation, which is in anywhere from one to five days. So CyberKnife, as compared to other forms of these shortened or radiosurgical techniques, is um, if you dissect out the term, cyber means robot. So there's a robotic arm that controls the delivery of the radiation, and knife. There's no knife involved. There's no even when you yeah, use like the word radio, something. yes, radio <laughs> surgery or cyber knife. There's no knife involved. But what the knife implies is that it's as precise and as sharp as a knife. But there's no surgery. It's a completely outpatient procedure. The advantage of cyber knife compared to say. Uh, gamma knife and other forms of uh, radio surgery is that the um, cyber knife was built on defense technology in that you know how when you watch a movie and you see a missile and then the it locks on to its target and moves with the target well that's what cyber knife does so for example if you're breathing um, the the cyber knife can lock onto the tumor and move with it and what that means is that we can deliver the dose right where we want it, to the tumor, but not the normal surrounding tissue. If you can't lock on to the moving target, that means that you have to draw a bigger target to encompass that movement within it. So there's much more normal tissue treated. The other way that you try to get around it is you immobilize the target. You try to push down on the lung, breath hole, do things like that, which is very unnatural and uncomfortable for the patient. So um, it blends high technology with high precision radiation. So who would be a candidate for a cancer patient's diagnosis? Is this, how would they know if this is a treatment that would work for them? It's a good question. We actually treat everything from brain tumors to uh, we cure lung cancer, we do pancreatic cancer, we do prostate cancer. So we treat all sorts of cancers with intent to cure. And it's a, a very good alternative to surgery. For example, in lung cancer, for the earliest stages of lung cancer, we have the same cure rates as surgery, wow. but yet the patients live their normal lives. They get treated in anywhere from three to five fractions, and there's no surgery involved. So it's, it's, a, it's a really nice option for patients. And I imagine, too, when it being more precise going for the tumor, less mm -hmm. side effects as well? Correct. And you would yes. have with other treatments? Oh, yeah. If you had surgery, you'd have the incision, you'd have potentially chest tubes, you'd have lots of issues with uh, just the surgery itself, potential for infection. We don't have any of that because there's no incision. And insurance covers it? Yes, this is an FDA approved treatment. So there, it's covered by all forms of it, most forms of insurance. And do you have to be referred by another No, you can be self-referred. Um, a lot of our patients come by word of mouth. And so you don't have to have a referral. You can just come self-referred. Very exciting technology. So if someone's interested in learning more information about it, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, so first of all, you could just Google uh, Healthy CyberKnife, or you could call 651-232-3111. And Healthy is just very quickly um, mm -hmm. that Healthy is opening a brand new cancer center in the Woodbury area, the yeah. Woodlands campus. Why don't you tell us just briefly it's about that? It's very exciting. We, uh, we have three radiation facilities, and this will be our third, and we're opening up a brand new radiation site with exciting technology going into that site. So it's, uh, it's very exciting for Healthies to have CyberKnife at St. Joe's, um, a, a traditional, what we call linear accelerator at St. John's, and then this brand new technology that's coming at Woodwind. So we have a, a wide variety of things to offer. Well, Dr. Cameron, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. I know you have a very busy schedule, so we really appreciate it. Okay. And great to know about CyberKnife. Thank, so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Still ahead, if you want to just wait one more mm -hmm. second. So still ahead, we'll be talking about Ebola and what you need to know about it. So stay with us, everyone. Our national forests are our inheritance, and their conservation our legacy. The Arbor Day Foundation asks for your help in replanting our national forests. Visit arborday.org. See how, together, we can plant our future. 
Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. We're pleased to now have with us Dr. John Kresniska. He's the Health East Vice President and Executive Medical Director of Acute Care Hospital. So thank you so much for being with us. And an emergency physician also. It's great to be here. Practice. Thank you. And it's been a while since you've been with us. Yeah, so we're glad to have to you back. Good to be back. So we're talking about Ebola. What, do, what is it exactly? We've heard so much about it. And um, I mean, what are the chances or risk of someone in Minnesota contracting it? Ebola is a disease. It's caused by a virus. Um, we've known about Ebola for about 30 years, um, and there have been probably 25 outbreaks of Ebola uh, that we know of. Uh, up until this time, all the cases of Ebola have been in Africa. And of course, it's been in the news a lot recently that there have been imported cases uh, to the United States more recently. Uh, we're, we're not sure uh, where exactly Ebola comes from. It's believed that there's an animal reservoir in Africa, and then occasionally a human will get infected and then cause an outbreak. All the previous outbreaks have been in isolated rural areas in Africa, and so they could be contained relatively quickly and relatively easily. This outbreak is different in that it's across several countries, it's in large urban areas, and so it's much, much more severe than any outbreak that's, that's ever happened. And then returning travelers have brought cases of Ebola back to the United States. Yeah, with traveling these days, worldwide traveling, it's so much smaller than our whole world. It doesn't take long for something like that, yeah. Right. Uh, so since it's caused by a virus, the only way that a person can get Ebola in the United States would be in, to be in close contact with a person who is infected with Ebola. Uh, we don't believe that people are infectious prior to the time that they get symptoms. Uh, so a person would need to be in close contact with a person who is having symptomatic Ebola in order to get infected. Um, and we're doing a lot of planning to try to quickly identify those patients and then isolate them so they wouldn't transmit a case to another person. Um, so I think the risk right now uh, for a person living in Minnesota is certainly very low, but the, the, the situation is changing rapidly, uh, and uh, so at this point in time, uh, we felt relatively comfortable that we'll be able to identify that and prevent it, but we're always monitoring the changing situation. And we're taping this at the beginning of November, but this program will be airing throughout the whole month, right. so things could change and people should stay tuned to the the Minnesota Department of Health and other the a CDC for updates and where things are and that exactly those are those are really the best sources for information the CDC the Centers for Disease Control across the country and the Minnesota Department of Health they've been very active in monitoring this and updating their recommendations regularly so hospitals in, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota across the country even though there is no active cases currently are preparing as they would for anything else. What about, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of that preparation and then what should our viewers do to protect themselves and their family? So we are doing uh, a lot of work preparing for the potential that a patient with Ebola could come to one of our hospitals. Uh, also clinics and urgent cares and across uh, our system and we're doing that in conjunction with the other hospitals in Minnesota and with the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, so we have a planning team that meets uh, every day to uh, look at the information that's coming out and what the risks are and to be able to prepare for that. Uh, the number one thing is we'd have to identify a patient uh, who might have Ebola, who might be at risk for Ebola, and then diagnose the case. So we've started asking patients when they come in about their travel history and if they have any symptoms. And then our computer systems will flag patients who are at risk so all the caregivers involved would know that that patient was potentially at risk for Ebola. The second thing we would then need to do would be to isolate and contain that patient. So we've set up special rooms in our emergency departments and in our hospitals where we would put those patients. And then uh, we'd want to protect the healthcare workers who were involved with those patients. So we're doing a lot of planning and training around personal protective equipment 
what the staff would need to wear, how they put it on, how they take it off safely. Because we know that that's effective if, if it's followed to the T. Exactly, but it's, uh, it's a set of steps that people need to follow very carefully. We actually put in place uh, a second person, and uh, a, an observer, who will read the instructions to the healthcare person and make sure they're doing each and every step correctly. Um, so, so that's the preparation. Um, we feel that by identifying patients early and isolating them, that other patients in the hospital would not be at risk. You actually have to come into quite close contact with an Ebola patient uh, in, order to, uh, in order to be at risk for infection. So we feel that we've set up uh, containment areas that would not allow other patients to come into any kind of contact with an Ebola patient. So it would still be safe for other patients to be at the hospital and not be at risk of being uh, infected. And Minnesota and other states um, have designated some f some hospitals that if if and, and if we ever do have a case, the patients would be most likely would be treated at one of these facilities. Then exactly. So uh, once the patient's identified and confirmed that they are an Ebola case, currently there are four hospitals in Minnesota that have been designated that would be receiving where those patients would be hospitalized. So of course all clinics and emergency departments and urgent cares still need to be uh, prepared for the possibility that they could receive an Ebola patient, but if the diagnosis was confirmed, they would be transferred to one of the receiving hospitals. In Minnesota, there are also some national uh, centers uh, that have expertise in this area, so it's possible they could also be uh, transferred to one of the national facilities. And if our viewers, if they had any questions, there's a statewide hotline by the Minnesota Department of Health that they could call? Right, uh, and obviously particularly people who um, have been in West Africa or are returning uh, from West Africa and have traveled in areas, and particularly patients who have uh, been exposed to patients with I uh, Ebola, we'd want them to identify mm -hmm. themselves and be monitored. We just have a couple of um, seconds, minutes left, and um, what we do know that does cause a, a greater risk to our viewers is the influenza, is the flu. It's coming, it's just around the corner. It's time to get your flu shot if you haven't already. What do we know about this year's, the vaccine that's out there to protect our, our anyone from the flu? Great, great point. We worry a lot about Ebola, but what we know is that influenza is much, much more common. It happens every year. It's preventable and it's treatable. So unlike Ebola, it is something that we should be actively doing something to, to prevent, and that is uh, getting vaccinated uh, and being prepared for that. The vaccine uh, doesn't last very long, so people need to get a repeat vaccine every year. Right, and if you haven't gotten it by this point, you can still get it. Even if flu starts coming out, you get some protection. Absolutely. People should get it. Uh, by, at this point, people should get the vaccine as soon as possible. Well, Dr. Krasnitz, it's always great to have you with us. Thank you. Great information. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Still ahead, well, pleasure to meet uh, an impressive woman, so stay with us. Thanks, everyone. I started. Now, everything you were going to do someday is on the calendar. Introducing a new day of the week. Someday. Want to retire someday? You'll want a My Social Security account to help you get ready. Get yours at socialsecurity.gov. Health East has just recognized more than 500 of its employees who have worked at the hospital and clinics for 10 to 55 years of service. Gina Schottmuller is one of them. I think I have a special place in my heart for St. Joe's. When you're having a good time, I guess time flies. You know, I cannot believe that I've been here 20 years. It seems to have gone by very quickly. The best part of my job is the relationships I think that I've made over the years. We're like a big family here. They are Health East nurses. They are Health East EMTs. They work in hundreds of medical and professional jobs at Health East across the entire organization. They are among the 541 Health East employees who are celebrating special milestones this year. 
from 10 to 55 years of service. They are the heart and soul of Health East. Celebrating more than a half century with Health East is Gina Schottmuller, who started with the organization in 1959, 55 years ago. My name is Gina Schottmuller. I have been a registered nurse and worked for Health East for 55 years. Currently, I'm working in the Clinical and Regulatory Performance Department. It was formerly called Quality Management. I started uh, a long time ago, 1959, and I worked in surgery for a number of years. And then I moved to the obstetric department as I had children of my own. After I left OB, I went into infection control and I worked here at Midway in the infection control department and I also worked in employee health here. Lots of things have changed in surgery, for instance. When I worked in surgery, we were still cleaning needles and sharpening them so that we could sterilize them and reuse them. That's unheard of these days, of course. Uh, we used to wash and stretch gauze after it was used on one patient and then we washed it, sterilized it, stretched it, and reused it on another patient. So we've changed lots of things, all for the better. I remember distinctly getting a call one day from a nurse in Divine Redeemer and they had their first patient that was diagnosed with AIDS and they were afraid for him to come out of his room. They didn't want the, they didn't want the volunteers to go into his room. We talked about how HIV is transmitted and how it was not transmitted. And the most marvelous thing for me was to see the change in behavior once they were educated and reassured. And that really warmed my heart to know that um, education changed that behavior and changed their attitude. I love people. I love helping people. And we'd like to give a special shout out to WCCO TV anchor Frank Basilero for narrating the video. And if you'd like to see all the employees who were recognized by Healthiest, check out the full video on the Healthiest YouTube channel and click on Employee Recognition. Well, we're very pleased to have with us in the studio, Gina. So thank you so much for being with us. And first of all, thank you for all your service, your years of service and caring for people in the East Metro all these years. Oh. I can't believe it. President Eisenhower was the president when you started. <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe that. Thank you for having me here today. It's a, my pleasure. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. So you've talked a little bit about things have changed mm -hmm. for you since when you first started as a young nurse. Um, what are some of the other things that have changed over these years? You know, I was thinking about that last night, and I remember when patients used to smoke in their beds. Oh, that's right. I remember doctors coming to the desks with cigarettes. I remember nurses having a little lounge. I think the focus now is on wellness, and I love that change. So we don't have to stay stuck uh, treating patients. I mean, we do treat patients, but the important thing is if we can be well, that is really better for all of us. So that's one of the big changes. I think technology has changed a lot. I think all the uh, laparoscopic procedures that are done so people don't have to stay in the hospital so long, um, lot, lots of changes, medications, treatments. I mean, I couldn't do bedside nursing anymore because there are just way too many changes, Jody. Wow, but you have kept up with the times I and have. the jobs. And one of the areas that you worked in, as you mentioned, um, for a while or for a number of years, mm -hmm. actually, was in infectious disease and prevention. Mm -hmm. And um, you talked about it seems like it's as relevant today when we're talking about Ebola right before this. So that, how did you get involved with infection Disease well, and probably wasn't even uh, was it a designated area of health when you first started? It was. It was required by the Joint Commission that you have an infection control nurse because of the infections patients were getting in the hospitals. So it was more about statistics and policies. I was working as the evening supervisor at Midway when this uh, opportunity opened at Midway Hospital. And one of the reasons I sort of looked at it seriously was because the job was four days a week, <laughs> 9 to 2.30. And any mom of four Very kids practical. loved those hours. You know, I got my children on the bus in the morning and I had cookies in the oven when they came home. So I took it the position mostly because of the benefit of the hours. But shortly after that, the AIDS epidemic hit, and then the focus changed on infection control. And it wasn't so much about 
infections in the hospital, that's always important, don't get me wrong, but we then focused on how to prevent the staff from becoming infected, educating them, the and physicians, the whole, I mean, the whole staff. It was a very exciting time. And education is very important, too. Very important. So what, um, you're so inspiring to do what you've done all these years. How do you, what, what motivates you to keep going, to stay involved, to be active in this? Well, I think my purpose in life is to serve, to love God and to serve other people. I love helping people. I just, I get such satisfaction from that. It doesn't matter if I'm baking for somebody or if I'm helping somebody in a work situation. I really do. Um, I, th I think I need to make a difference in life. And so that's kind of my goal, Jody. A retirement, I never really liked that word. I sort of like refirement. So I kind of switched gears and um, continue to work, but I'm doing something different now. And talking about how you love to give, besides 55 years mm. caring for patients in the Twin Cities East Metro here, you um, also do a lot of international humanitarian work. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that? Thank you. Um, af shortly after my husband died, I was invited to go with Shepherds Foundation, which is a Christian organization, and to go into Ukraine and to teach areas of my expertise so I could teach about hand washing and about hepatitis and HIV. And I did that. And I've been there, I think, seven times. Wow, good for you. Um, it's a wonderful experience. And I travel with, you know, physicians and other nurses and a great team. It's, been a, it's just been a joy for me. And the people there love it when we come and love to learn from us. Um, so it's been a great experience. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great that you do that. Thank you. So final comments about your all these years working, 55 years. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even stay any place that long. <laughs> well, it's gone very quickly, that I will say. And when I retired in 2000, um, and then they called me back to work. I don't work full time. Everybody needs to know that. So, you know, at my age, you don't want to be working full time. Um, but I, I love the relationships. I love the contacts that I have with my friends. I don't have much patient contact anymore. But while I was a nurse, I love that patient contact. I mean, while I was a nurse in my former um, opportunities. But yeah, so I do enjoy what I do. I I, I can't say that I get tired uh, of doing it. I stay well, um, and that's important. I want to serve. I want to serve until I can't anymore. Well, Gina, really such a pleasure to have you with us on this show. So thank you for sharing your experience, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Jody. I'm sure I there's it. thousands of patients that would be saying that to you if they were with me at this point. So oh. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your service. So still ahead, we're going to meet a local woman who has lost more than 60 pounds this past year. We're going to hear her secret and how she did it when we come back. Stay with us. I realized at that moment, these people really needed us. And I was going to make a difference right here in my community. Be there for your community at NationalGuard.com. And finally, in this program, in our last program, we showed you a video of Amy's story and how she lost weight and gained back her life after a terrible, terrible car accident. Well, we're very pleased to have Amy Hellerud with us. Join us here in the studio. So thank you, Amy, for being with us. Thank you, Joy. So you were just telling me you've lost more than 60. You've lost almost 70. 70, yes. 70 pounds. So, and you did this all this year. Yes. Why don't you kind of tell us how did you get started? I think that's the hardest thing for people in any weight loss program. Yeah. And how do you keep going? And it got started because my husband made me go to the doctor. <laughs> it was a year ago um, from the car accident. I've had many different things that have come up, and I got tinnitus, and so I had really, really bad ringing in the ear. wasn't sleeping at night, and that's when it prompted me. He encouraged me to go back in and get tested. And so she, my doctor is so thorough, and she did CAT scan, MRI, and before could even call me back with the results, said you need to come in because you have diabetes now and you have high blood pressure. Oh my gosh! And On so top that's of everything. That's what triggered it, and she's so thorough and had said that she had been working on this program and hadn't launched yet, but I could be the first to join. I'm like, absolutely. And so, and that's when I took that first step. And so we didn't even do it the traditional way they do it now, but her and I just worked on one-on-one -on -one and brought a nutritionist in later and started working on the program and my diet and with the weight loss. How 
I mean, how diff how much difference did that make having the doctor 100%. work with you on this versus just going to a, a program or a clinic, I mean, a, a gym or something like that? Well, and I went in with the idea, you know, I'm going to join a gym. And she said, don't. Just because of your brain injury and your back injury, let's start with us. Let's get you on the nutrition piece, you know, get your sugar levels down, get your, your blood pressure regulated. And start with the diet portion. And there were so many tools involved with it and people, she brought a nutritionist in, said I don't want you to start working out until you lose 10%, um, meet with me monthly and we're gonna monitor you. And so we use a website, um, loseit.com, work with email. I email the nutritionist still weekly sometimes. If I struggle or I have questions or there's things I need to change on the diet, they help with that aspect. But it, it, it's her, it's the support, it's, it's the vitamins, it's the meds, it's everything, them watching all your blood, your sugar, all your levels to help you stay on track. So this program is at the Healthy Stillwater yes. Clinic. And um, unlike typically when you go see the doctor, they might say, oh, you should lose a couple of pounds, mm -hmm. that's it, and you're on your own. But she was with you every step of the way? Every step, and even now monitoring, knowing when to take me off certain meds. Um, I take metformin, and our goal is that I won't have to be on those meds long term. And that's why I go in monthly and checking not just the blood pressure, but I get all my levels and my blood work tested as well. And then now that I'm working with a trainer, we also work on the nutrition piece too. If I'm struggling, which I have been lately, I'll honestly say, you do get I think to that's that. Typical, isn't it, it is, and it is. And you have to switch up, you know, your carbs and what you're going to take, and they all work together. So it, the big difference is it's a team. It's a team that all communicates. They all are on the same page and they all have the same information and they work with me, whether it's in Woodbury or at the Stillwater location. And you, I think you had told me in the past you had tried some other weight loss mm -hmm. programs. So what were some of the things that you learned that worked for you that maybe might work for some of our viewers? The big difference, the, the big difference, I think, any, with any program is you get bored. And, you know, you can stick with the program for so long, but when you don't have the follow-up and the accountability and the support that you get from a doctor and from a team, and working with the trainer is really what kept me motivated and helped change. I haven't lost as many pounds as I've lost inches. We just measured last week, and I lost probably like 35 inches. Wow. So that's that amazing. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. It is. And would you have thought you'd be at this point in January? No. When you first started? Not at all. Not at all. No. It just, it's been amazing. And that's what really has kept me excited and going because the Ways to Wellness program has more than just a trainer. They have classes. They've incorporated selling, you know, vitamins, um, nutritional aids there, cookbooks. They really try to always change it up to help you, you know, and, and keep you excited about going. So if someone's out there watching and they're saying, um, you know, I just can't lose this weight, I can't even get started, what would you tell them? And it sounds so stupid and simple, go to your doctor. You know, go to your doctor. I've referred my doctor to about a half a dozen people in the last month. And don't be intimidated by a trainer and doing one-on-one. -on -one. The Ways to Wellness program is open to the public and for everyone. And um, if you are interested, we have a phone number that you can call. That number is 651-471-5622. Again, 651-471-5622. And that's the number for the Healthy Stillwater Clinic Weight Loss Program. It's been working great for you, and you would recommend it for others as I well? I would, absolutely. Well, Amy, Great to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your story. It's an amazing story. Very incredible. So thank you. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time, and we'll see you back here on Inside Healthcare. See you then, everyone. Inside Healthcare. For more information, visit stjohnshospital-mn.org or call 651-326-7800.